Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. And just, first of all, let me just uh, say how grateful I am that we have this kind of a community. Um, it's just a delight. I look around. I see, I see friends. I see people I don't know. But we are all just you know, passionate about the world and innovation and bringing forth with all this wonderful technology, you know, solving humanity's global challenges. So it's just wonderful to be part of this community. Um, I'm also very happy, grateful to be part of uh, CDL. Uh, this is my second year as a fellow. And uh, we just get a chance to have... Um, to all. In the last two days, we saw 50 AI and machine learning companies, you know, all startups, uh, passion entrepreneurs bringing, you know, all the great ideas. And uh, we have then a group of uh, fellows and a group of associates and everyone putting all of their just intense energy and focus on how can we help these companies, uh, you know, to thrive. Um, so it's just wonderfully part of, you know, this life in this community. Um, so I'm going to talk about crucial questions for applying AI. Um, most of the things people have been talking about are, you know, what's the technology, how does the technology work, and what can it do? Um, I've been through a lot of different uh, AI projects on all sides, and I think I can talk, which one here? It's this way, this way? There we go. So yeah, I'm a long-time technologist, entrepreneur, um, investor and advisor. I've been involved in AI things from all those different sides. Um, I was counting. I've probably been involved in more than 100 AI you know, projects and applications in one way or another by now. Um, uh, you know, I worked in a SRI in natural language understanding systems at NASA in uh, cross, you know, AI applications across all the kinds of NASA missions. Um, some of the exciting things I did at NASA were putting up the first AI system um, in deep space. So we actually had the first time in a, an entire spacecraft, the AI system could control to take over, execute its goals, recover from failures, and so on. And that was really exciting, going from technology in the research lab um, in a period of a few years to uh, you know, a multi-hundred million dollar space mission um, that would fail if, if our system messed up. Um, and uh, uh, PowerSet was a natural language-based search engine, so we licensed the technology developed at Xerox PARC, their crown jewels, uh, for 30 years uh, to basically parse the web into a deep semantic representation. Um, that was at a time when we could see that uh, five years ago the computing technology didn't exist in the world to do what we wanted to do. Around that, you know, in, you know, can say in five or ten years, it was going to be obvious that we had the computing power, but right then it was a question, could you even do that kind of stuff? Um, and, um, you know, in order to do that, we actually had to embrace and actually develop a bunch of these uh, uh, technologies for you know, large-scale cloud computing and so on. Um, Powers is acquired by Microsoft, and so I had a chance to help uh, to launch Bing, um, led the roadmap around semantic and, and knowledge-based technology, so a lot of different AI projects there, um, and also uh, helped develop a conversational assistant uh, that became Cortana. Uh, Singular University is dealing with all kinds of exponential technologies, and here we're in the CDL. So that's just a few things. There's a number of startups that we could talk about. Um, AI is starting to impact all, all, all industries and all aspects of life. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for it. Um, you know, the computation, big data, algorithms advanced, I think a big one that's not often talked about is the worldwide scientific communities, sharing knowledge, data, and code. It's pretty amazing. And now every single week there's some new paper coming out that in prior times would have been kind of the, the breakthrough of a whole year, and now they're coming out at the rate of one a week. Um, there's also been a revolution in microservices and APIs. It used to be if you wanted to get AI deployed somehow, you had to go and you know, reconstruct a monolithic application or build the whole thing yourself. Now, with microservices, you can put the, some of the knowledge just into a little piece of something, and it can insert into other systems. And we can now also compose and share people's systems in the point you even have serverless architectures. Uh, they're very interesting. So um, that's about the tech, some of the technology improvements. Um, but applying AI successfully is hard. Um, there are many issues that can lead to failure. And the art of the application is actually harder than the technology. Um, and it's actually much, much less understood, and many fewer people actually thinking about this and sharing knowledge. Um, it also turns out that the needs of the application often drive the requirements of the technology. Which technology you choose depends on what your application actually needs. You often don't discover those until you're in the middle of trying to actually really make that application work and finding out why it was failing. Um, and in fact, the need of the applications may drive whole new requirements on the technology, which is one of the really fun things about working in applied artificial intelligence is you can actually then kind of find out what technology really needs to be. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to understand um, the cross-cutting issues, because these issues tend to occur in this application and this application time and time again. 
Um, they're rarely generalized. And if we can understand those issues and find ways to catch them early and also address them, then we can make a better job, uh, avoid a lot of failures, avoid a lot of wasted time, make a better job in the startup companies and our products and kind of the investment decisions and employments that we make. Okay, um, so, so this talk I'm going to address some of these issues. I'm working on assembling uh, a much larger list, and this is a teaser of some of those things. Um, I don't have much time, so I have to go super fast. Um, so we've been with the AI Goldilocks zone. Um, we generally begin by thinking about what we can do. Often we have this AI technology. And then we're trying to find what customers need our technology. So we finally find some customers that need our, need our technology. And the intersection of what we can do and uh, what the customers need, that's our opportunity. And we get very excited about that. And we think about, this is great. Our AI system can solve this. is super good. Um, first of all, it's hard to find. Often we, the customers, the binding problem where customers actually know what we have is often hard. But um, we then have to actually ask ourselves, what are the alternatives to uh, this innovation we want to have? What else would the customers really do if they're trying to solve these problems? Um, that alternative drives a lot of you know, the bar that your AI actually has to hit. So you can now look at the, uh, the different intersections in this Venn diagram. So we really like the things that we can do and the customers need. That's great. But if actually others can do that too, then our problem is what I would call too soft. So it's like the Goldilocks which goes to the, uh, you know, the bear's house and there's the baby bear's bed which is too soft. Papa's bear's bed is too hard and mama's bear's bed is just right. So in this case, um, we really want to find things that are so hard that all these other competitors and approaches just can't work. Only our technology. But often, most of the time, <laughs> when that's true, it's actually for us too. Okay, so you really have to honestly, critically ask yourself, where are we in this space in the Goldilocks zone? And how big is that Goldilocks zone? Give the maximum benefit of doubt to the alternatives. And in fact, if we think about these circles, what really happens is that we don't really know the customer needs. Um, we overestimate what we can do, and we radically underestimate what the alternatives or what others can do. So you actually then wind up with basically, there may actually not be any sweet spot, and you find that out a bit too late. So these are all critical questions. Uh, I try to ask them of every project that I'm involved with. Um, related to this, and just thinking about that one, is so what do the customers need and what can we do? A key issue, we, we tend to think that AI will either work or won't work, but a really key issue is quality. So the question that I'm asking all the time is, how good does the AI need to be useful in that application? What is actually the quality bar? Um, the general response I get from people is, that's a really good question. We should go and, go and think about that. Um, but that question actually drives like half of your product design and the success or part failure of your product. Um, once you ask that, then well, actually, how are you going to measure? Uh, how are you going to measure the quality that's required? Um, and then, how good is your system today? Again, how are you measuring it? Are you actually honest about that? Is that the right set of measurements? And then, um, how hard will it be to achieve that desired quality? What's your actual path? And if the path is well, we're in a very often case in machine learning, we get 70% accuracy in three weeks, we feel great. Um, but then we actually the task requires 95% accuracy, and we have no idea how much additional data is required, if ever, to get to that level of accuracy. So you know, that can be a science project. It's OK, but it's good to know at the start. Um, an another, just one example of the quality question would be, we, we had a, one of the companies, a neat company, doing a wearable calorie counter on your wrist. And um, you know, this is a dream thing to just count your calories. And then the question that we asked was, well, how good does it need to be? Um, and you know, they didn't really know. And they said, well, the FDA says that a calorie counter, as long as 80% of the time is within 20%, sorry, as long as 80% of the time is within 20% of that number, that counts as a calorie counter. But if you think about it, that means that a consumer will eat a steak 20% of the time, it'll say that's 100 calories. Right? And a salad will say it's 1,000, and they'll put down the device and never use it. So um, we encounter these things all the time. These are great questions to ask. And the recommendations go quite deep. Um, you know, one example is you need to understand the payoff matrix for your quality outcomes. Uh, what's the payoff for the false positive, false negative, correct positive, all those things. When we look at that matrix, understand the precision and recall trade-offs and their impact on the solution design. Um, and then, um, you know, ultimately, you can use a mix of humans and automation to increase that quality. That was talked about in several of the previous talks. Um, you know, and then lower your expectations. What are the expectations? How we lower expectations of the user so that we can actually match what the quality is and then make it work. Okay. Um, I am super low on time because this is such a small amount of time here. Um, robustness is a key issue. Um, you know, what happens when things fail and how are we going to manage that? Um, there's a bunch of corrective actions you can take. Um, a big one is usability. 
Um, so usability, who are the users of the system? Okay. Um, what really know them? It's not just one. It's often a different set of users that produce different pieces of things. Um, how are they going to discover the features of the AI system? A huge problem. Okay. Um, and then once they think they've understood those features, is it sort of habitable in the mind of the user to know and remember what's doable and not doable? Um, then what are the expectations they bring? And what are their expectations and how should the whole thing work in the presence of errors? So an example here is a conversational interface within chatbots. I've been involved in a number of projects. And, you know, it sounds so great that you can interact in natural language with the system. It'll chat to you. And that's more natural because that's the way we normally work. That's true if it's as good as a person. Um, and if it really knows everything you'd expect a person to know in, in this domain. But if it's not, then, you know, how do you actually know what you should be able to say to the system so that it actually works? And that's a question to ask of every single chatbot company and every single natural interface. You know, the GUI, you see from the menu is what you can pull down, and that, you know, that's all you get. So it's a really interesting, and this, this usability against self-driving cars, um, well, they may not be perfect. They, they, they work sometimes in some conditions and not in some conditions. So, but when do you know when you can take the hands off or not and trust the car or not trust the car? And so whether a person can actually understand it and use it um, can determine the success or failure of the project. These things are often found um, you know, much later. So you know, recommendations are to measure the quality from end user perspective and model the entire mind of the user and how they're going to use the system and think about it all the way through the workflows. Um, another key issue, and I skip through a slide, is trust. And OK. Yeah, so trust is a gating item for nearly all app AI applications. Um, in the shortage of time, you know, there's lots of reasons why we shouldn't trust these AI systems, even if we think they look like we're performing well on our training data. That was brought up. James brought it up several books. So, you know, who needs to trust the system to be successful? What are the key aspects that need to be trusted and the biggest outcomes? How important, and, and a key issue is how important is explanation in this issue? I think we're going to be faced with a lot of times we have to decide between an explana a system we can explain, explain itself and a system that performs better. One of the big challenges, you know, for the next uh, decade of work. And then what is the optimal division of labor between human and machine? Um, almost always entrepreneurs come in and say it should be fully automated, and almost always you know, the answer is no, it shouldn't be fully automated. It should be what's the right mix of the right question. This happened with NASA in our spacecraft. They wanted to make it fully automated, and the mission operator said every time you automate something, I have to like, hire two more people to manage it. Um, because we know that there will be problems, and if it's an autonomous system, then you know, how, it's, all, it's even harder to, manage, to know the problems, harder to resolve it. These things get way more complicated. So sometimes, I mean, autonomy doesn't necessarily make things easier. It adds a whole level of new requirements, and you've got to take the fact that humans have to still be able to interact with it as additional requirements on top. So the thing is that it's super hard, but you have to recognize that going in. Okay. Um, so, you know, what is the optimum division of labor between humans and machines? What requirements that division place on the humans and on the machines? Um, what's the most extreme version of automation that could be possible? Because sometimes we're being too conservative, and by being too conservative, it doesn't work. So Google experimented with, well, we'll just throw away the steering wheel, because, in fact, the steering wheel is harming us, because it puts requirements to people they can't actually manage anyway. Um, and then, you know, what are the most natural insertion points of the automation? So I think, you know, this notion of, like, wrapping... Wrapping a service like x.ai does is quite interesting, where you're talking to someone who's an assistant. Maybe there's a person, maybe there's a bot. They can, that division can change over time. It lets you evolve in a way where you always have a fully functional system. And then just leave with one company that I, I'm an advisor to, and we, uh, several of us are involved with. It's called Crowdflower. And it's a crowdsourcing digital work platform. It's centered around human in the loop. So you, you, know, you have basically labeled training data you need to assemble. You send the results out to human labelers. And then the system, so that automates that process, uh, aside it's not talked about very often. But then the system actually starts seeing how well could I have predicted what the person would have done for its labeling. And when it's good, it just starts basically doing that labeling automatically itself, leaving the people to label the autumns that are harder. And you wind up with this and it becomes more automated, better allocation of human work. Humans never leave. They just start spending their time on the harder and harder problems and things evolve. So to conclude, um, I want to bring this knowledge front for researchers, entrepreneurs, product managers, executive investors, and even for the consumers to understand what are the issues we should be asking ourselves, the crucial challenges. And you know, each project is critical investment of our time and money. And the lessons don't necessarily transfer. But as a community, I think we can build, you know, imagine building a database of all the projects with the, what were the issues that came up, 
Um, we know what did we try, what worked, what didn't work, and this database we've been open resource for all of us. So I'm kind of encouraging the community to start collecting this knowledge. I think a forum like this is a great place. Just being part of everyone talking and not seeing what they learn, we're seeing very common themes. So in short, in understanding the crucial issues that are gaining us in the actual applications and treating the application knowledge as seriously as we are the fundamental technology, I think we've really unleashed the power of AI to uh, change the world. Thank you.